once upon a time there was a show called Poet the Poet. And that once upon a time is now because this is the name of the show and uh, my name is Robert Dunn and I host it. And our exceptionally special guest today is P.H. Mellon. I'll be telling you all about her in a moment. But I was staring at these, uh, these flowers, uh, carnation mums or whatever they might be, it reminds me that I just got back from uh, something on my day job, my company picnic. And this is what happened there. Six dollars for a hot dog and a spot by the volleyball net. The junior accountant trainee looks good in the three-legged sack race. Any takers? Is this my hot dog? It looks like a bituminous tent peg or a charcoal or something or other. What do you mean it's good for my complexion? El Paso Grande is one step ahead of an incense swarm of bees. He is persuaded into jumping into the lake. Wish I was a bee. Ms. Prince from the typing pool has shinned up some stately oak with our chief dispatcher. They are playing a cross between farmer in the dell and catcher in the rye. Volleyball isn't everything, I suppose. I wander back to the barbecue pit, which can be smelled in Rio de Janeiro, and ask for a hamburger. I am in turn asked for a stamp requisition from El Paso Grande himself. And just what did I expect for a lousy six bucks anyway? Sadly, El Paso Grande has taken his stand at the bottom of Lake Tomaso, playing with his toes and gurgling, I dare you to cross this line, at the persistently perturbed apiarians. I can see the field and go to get sick on the beer, and then I notice Miss Prince is eyeing me speculatively while provocatively plucking at her bodice, seeking to dislodge a misdirected yet enterprising acorn. You see, those company picnics are more fun than you thought, isn't it? Poetry isn't everything unless it's written by someone like D.H. Mellon. Oh, and let me, let me tell you a little about D.H. Mellon. She's a poet, a critic, a novelist. This is a novel, by the way, it's called Blight. We'll be hearing, hearing a little bit more of uh, Blight in a moment. Uh, all sorts of things. She won the American Book Award for uh, Literary Criticism. Uh, what was the subject of all that criticism? Uh, it was black poetry. Uh, the book was called Heroism and the New Black Poetry. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, yeah. a subject very dear to my heart. Uh, the poets are dear to my heart, too. And you have uh, all kinds of poetry volumes uh, floating around. What was it? Nightmare on 94 Street? Was it? <laughs> No, wait a minute. No, so, no, no. Oh, no, it's on 94th Street. No, it's on 94th Street. Okay. You still didn't get over that thing. <laughs> I guess not. Where do I tell you what was in the hot dog? <laughs> okay, this is my first book, Notes on 94th Street. Mm -hmm. And I live on 94th Street on the west side. Uh -huh. and, and, um, and then you see a lot of strange things oh, out of your. I see all kinds of things. And, <laughs> and it's wonderful. I, I say that my. My room extends the street, and of course it works the other way too. Mm -hmm. uh, I look out the window and I see my neighbors uh -huh. and all kinds of uh, people, not just people who live in my building, but uh, uh, the whole west side, and, which uh -huh. I think is a, a microcosm, really. Your room extends the street? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. Does yeah. that mean you get delivery trucks through here? We get. <laughs> <laughs> or through there? UPS. Ah. <laughs> Okay, to give them a plug. <laughs> well, we'll hear about it, but that's okay. Um, so, I imagine you have, uh, obviously, you have a number of uh, strange and provocative poems about what goes on well, on the Upper West Side. You know my poetry, I think, because some of the poems are indeed strange. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's a strange world, anyway. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a magazine I rather like, I think. Some of you have heard of it, or like everybody here has heard of it. <laughs> Medicinal purposes, and um, it's good for what else, you guess. That's <laughs> and uh, Robert kindly accepted a poem of mine for this magazine, and it's the premier issue, and I'm very proud of that. It's all coincidental. Yeah, and this poem is called "Naked Woman Walks Down the Street," and this absolutely <laughs> happened. <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> When you live on the second floor, it's really it's, uh, an experience. <laughs> Majestic, a living statue with a train of curious children who crown her with laughter and shrieks. Before she rounds the corner to be plucked into a police car, 
I see her lead an army of homeless people who rise up from Penn Station and Grand Central and the Port Authority bus terminal and the next block. And the woman is clothed in rainbow and light from hummingbird wings. Her followers turn to moving stone and bronze. They drop off in ones and twos along Broadway, stationing themselves at the head of subway stairs. Their hands are raised and their fists, fists are clenched. Their stone and bronze children are pointing. One cannot run past without touching them. The touch is electric to feel those statues, their malice, their might. And that's what it's like sometimes. <laughs> Well, not every day. Around here. Well, we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't get that sort of thing in NIAC, I think, or, or Queens for that matter. Usually people are clothed. Uh -huh. And uh, this was so mm -hmm. an unusual occasion. Um, sometimes they even come in costumes. So it's like, yeah. It's yeah right. Regular Mardi Gras here <laughs> on the west side, if you're ever in town. A company picnic every day. Ah, yes. <laughs> and 94th Street certainly has a chair of. Uh, Let's see, you're fingering light with the... I'm fingering light. Actually, so am, I, so am I, as yeah. a matter of fact. Pe people tell me that my bark is worse than mine, but, well, never mind. We'll get into <laughs> that. Um, what is what is Dunn my... rhymes with pun, or pun rhymes with dumb? I didn't plan it that way. Okay, all right. Okay, this, um, I read from that. He, he's yeah. got the, 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 the version the real, of the, 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 the bookstore. <laughs> And this is what I like to read from because these are um, bound galleys and it's a big picture of um, an Henri Rousseau painting uh, of a carnival scene. And uh, it's quite uh, interestingly ironic that uh, we selected this painting for the cover because uh, if you read light, as I hope you will, uh, you'll see that the, the people, these strange little creatures that actually grow out of the ground and they never get to be more than a foot tall. And they're not cold. Creatures? Creatures. Well, they're, you can call them humanoids. You can call them, uh, in, in one review, the uh, uh, review of Publishers Weekly, I think, um, the writers spoke about uh, my dealing with interspecies communication, ah. and um, I guess that's an, that's one way of looking at it. But uh, I think of uh, these little people as a microcosm, and the idea for Blight uh, has as its source a real garden. And out on Long Island, I used to uh, we, we built a little house when the children were small, and. Um, I used to try to grow things in this little bit of ground. And things would start up out, out of the ground, and I was, you know, full of enthusiasm you know, for whatever. They were flowers or vegetables or something. And then you and start then oil. Monk, yeah, you know, <laughs> oil. I struck fungus. Oh, fungus, <laughs> yes. Yeah. And uh, the, the, the plants would just stop growing and die. And this happened, and I wanted to be an organic gardener, so I was not going to put any more poison into the ground than was already there. So um, I, I just sort of gave up on it. But uh, the idea of strange things growing out of this ground, that we have tainted, I mean, this earth of ours, this environment is really tainted. And it's, um, I think it's amazing that we can grow anything. Ah. So if you were going to be an organic gardener, yeah. Perhaps you should have played them organ music. Yeah, it, it might, that might have worked. Mm -hmm. Live, of course, because <laughs> uh, otherwise it would have been technologically uh, effective. Yeah. Well, um, if, if, All right. if, so if, in Blight, there's, yeah. a, there's a fellow. And yeah, Joseph. This is right. a lonely man. Mm -hmm. And uh, his son is married in California. And uh, his wife is he's a widower. And he. Um, he is, um, uh, he's a sensitive person, and, uh, but uh, very, very isolated. And, well, what, uh, shall I read a oh, little yes. bit? Okay, I'll, I'll read sudden. just a little bit. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, he was growing things in his garden and nothing, you know, 
The same thing happened to him that happened to me. <laughs> That's why I really mm -hmm. identify with Joseph. <clears throat> This is not the very beginning. Eventually there was silence. Sooner or later we all sit in that silent station by the window. Yet as the silence of nature took over, I could hear it more clearly as it swirled into the sounds of insects and birds and changing weather. The natural world approached until I could feel the weight of leaves pressing against the windows. The birds sang early and late. Storms clattered about the house and shook the floorboards. Mostly it was quiet, and I tried to let the peaceable days pervade my spirit. Instead, I felt more and more the chill of stone. I thought of Emma in a nearby graveyard I no longer visited. With a peculiar detachment, I imagined my name with various terminal dates carved neatly beneath hers. What had it all meant? What had we meant to each other in sickness and health? I had performed the duties expected, nursed her in her final illness. Now I was married to silence. Nevertheless, sometimes I could feel a rumbling different from that of the probing thunder, a rumbling coming from the earth itself, as if it were getting ready to erupt. Maybe just one more uh, when, when section. Do we, when do we get into where the little people start uh, running here around, they come. Here taking they come. over the house? Here they come. Well, <laughs> well, that, that, you can't get all of that here. <laughs> and now, I'm willing. Uh, the, the, the land, the land I'm willing, but you're not going to have our show. Okay. But this is his uh, first encounter with the people. I made myself cross the patio briskly, then turned. Looking up from the grass to the garden, could not take another step. The fear at the root of my imaginings had finally emerged. The plants were gone. Against the foundation, like an ancient frieze, huddled ten small, thin bodies. Yes, bodies I acknowledged in horror and relief. They and they were imbued with an unmistakable vitality. The creatures seemed so terrified that I, equally frightened, made no sound. They were pale, mushroom-colored, their staring eyes the hue of mushroom gills. Their slow, convulsive clutchings were like the movements of newborn infants, extending their arms, making fists, flexing their knees, perfect, minute fingers, a suggestion of toes. These were adult bodies, however, thin, elongated, apparently sexless. I could distinguish no sign of hair. As I gazed, my fear gave way to ludicrous images, a carnival sideshow, glabrous guys and gals, if they turned out to be male and female, or glabrous ghouls, if they were neither. I pictured them holding a televised press conference, quizzed by leading scientists and reporters with ensuing headlines, new species uncovered, evolution jumps forward, evolution leaps backward, a new how-to book entitled Grow Your Own People. National advertising campaigns by wig makers showing them before and after. I laughed aloud. They started, and in a moment a whiff of that same malevolent smell assailed me. I stepped back. Yet I would have to speak, no matter how fearful they were. I had to know whether they could vocalize as well as hear and see. Already I felt that we could communicate. Hello. I said softly. They remained motionless. The odor, thank God, was not emitted. I realized that to those small creatures, I loomed a giant, threatening extinction. My height alone instilled mistrust. I sat down, changing my position as slowly as possible, watching them for any new evidence of alarm. They trembled and drew closer together. Hello, I repeated. Who are you? What are you doing here? They appeared to relax. The clutching subsided. Bodily motions became defined, as if control and complexity were developing before my eyes. 
the heap of life separated into parts, two ventured a foot or so away from the rest. Deliberately, I extended my arms in a gesture of welcome. One creature took a wavering step toward me, then drew back into the group. Hello, I repeated. At first, I heard something like the gurgling cool of a pigeon, the sound growing and fluttering about them. I saw mouths open and close. Hello, I told them again. All the mouths were moving now, and the sounds grew louder, clearer, until I distinguished a syllable. Hello. My God, I thought, they are imitating me. Hello, 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 they said. Hello, hello, I insisted. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. Finally, one of them said, hello. I was swept by a need to embrace that marvelous being, which so lately out of the ground and off a stalk could already mimic the complexity of sounds expressed in a single word. I must have started up because the figure suddenly retreated. I gave up the prospect of contact for the present and concentrated on building their trust. A small fellow came forward. 